My name is Jason Bordoff. I'm the director of the Center on Global Energy Policy here at Columbia and a professor of uh, professional practice here at the School of International and Public Affairs. And I'm really uh, thrilled by the group of people that we have uh, joining us uh, this evening uh, to talk about uh, climate change, smart grid, the future of electric utilities. And I really can't imagine a better person to talk about that than Peter Fox Penner. Uh, Peter wrote an ex fantastic book about this topic, which is right here. Uh, and and for those of you who are interested in all of these topics, the future of utility regulation, uh, smart grids, how we can better manage our electricity consumption, what it all means for the planet and our economy, uh, it's a really fantastic overview. Peter was one of those people when I was in government we had on speed dial uh, to help us understand things uh, a little bit better when difficult issues came up. And, and he's been really a fantastic mentor and friend for uh, a long time. Um, <clears throat> he is a uh, principal and chairman at the Brattle Group. Uh, he focuses on economic, mm -hmm. regulatory, and strategic issues in network industries, uh, an expert on a variety of energy, uh, environmental, and, and economic issues affecting electricity regulation, planning, competition, uh, policy issues, and um, just pick an energy issue, uh, what's happening in natural gas in the U.S., our transportation sector, uh, communications, environmental uh, regulation. Uh, he has spent spent a lot of time thinking about it and writing about it and analyzing it uh, and, and is a, a real fantastic uh, uh, expert in it who's going to help us understand it today and has a long and distinguished background also in government service uh, at the Department of Energy uh, and at the White House as well as in uh, other government positions. Peter's going to present uh, his book and some updates that he has done to it since it was written. And then I'm really delighted that in terms of some uh, ability to get some reactions and commentary to it, uh, <clears throat> we're going to hear from Ron Bins and from our own David Sandelow. Uh, Ron, many of you know, was chairman of the Colorado Public Utilities Commission, appointed by Governor Bill Ritter in January 2007, served until April 2011. Uh, and his background in the utility sector is really way too long and distinguished to go into here, but he led the Colorado PUC in implementing many of the policy changes that were championed by the governor as part of Colorado's new energy economy and is an expert in everything that Peter will be uh, talking about. And we at the center had a very effective strategy to make sure that uh, he was able to be here uh, today uh, by, by torpedoing. No, we didn't really do that. But uh, many of you know uh, that our, the nation's loss is our small little gain that he's able to be here today, uh, having uh, been, been selected to, uh, to, to head FERC, but, but is here today instead for a variety of reasons you can ask him about. Uh, and then David Sandelow was the Undersecretary of Energy uh, at the Department of Energy and uh, is now a fellow here at the Center on Global Energy Policy and he'll be uh, uh, giving some reactions as well. And then Travis Bradford, professor here at SEPA, will uh, pose a few questions to the group and, and uh, give some reactions and then moderate a discussion with all of you. So with that, let me turn it over to Peter. <clears throat> Thanks, Jason. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out here and uh, all over the web. Um, it's only the the second time in my life, believe it or not, I've been to Columbia. The Brattle Group has many Columbia alumni on its staff, and they were very excited to see how it was coming. Um, but I have watched many webcasts from uh, here, and um, I always imagined a room full of bright students and faculty and Columbia community people in a high rise overlooking Manhattan. And sure enough, <laughs> here we are. Um, but I'm usually watching over the web. So it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to come to this um, this particular center. Um, I was very excited to hear that Jason was heading it up and w I am not at all surprised to see the speed at which he's assembled a really wonderful team, including many old friends, David, who I've known for m decades now. And um, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to uh, present here um, and uh, that he's given me an opportunity to talk to you about um, literally what's happened since I published Smart Power, um, which I, I wrote four years ago, published it three years ago, and I'm kind of starting, this is really the kickoff of kind of a updating tour, you might say, that'll culminate in the fall with um, probably an update of the book. So you are sort of seeing the first draft of that, and I'm really fortunate to have not only David, but Ron Bins and Travis here to comment on 
um, what I'm seeing and what they're seeing. And I think it will be a very, very uh, rich discussion. Um, so let's get to it. Um, uh, in 2010, um, I, I really thought the industry was at the cusp of a true transformation, a, a once in a hundred year transformation. The biggest since, since the industry was really born in around the 1910s, 1920s. And the drivers, which I thought were all coming together at a unique time, really just by accident of history, since the drivers aren't, you know, uh, necessarily connected. But um, climate change policy, um, which, although it was bigger on the national radar screen in 2010, I still think it's there. I think everybody in the industry thinks it's there, and it's not going away. But um, let, me, let me stick to the 2010 picture. Climate change policy was big. Um, if you remember, the new, new thing in 2010 was the smart grid, and it was going to take over the regular grid. Then um, the ARRA, the Obama stimulus package, was handing out a lot of, lots of money in that direction. It was expected to come on very quickly. Um, another thing that was in it, what I would say it's a zenith at that point were the state renewable portfolio standards. Those are the state laws that mandate utilities by a certain, an increasing percentage of their power each year from renewable sources. Uh, that was the big deal in renewables at that point. Um, sales growth was declining then. The recession had hit us, and um, we were starting to see it. I'll talk more about that. And of course, renewables were getting cheaper even back then. So what's happened since then? Um, <clears throat> Most of the, the drivers that were promoting transformation have, um, I think, accelerated. Um, the, re the recession has lowered sales growth, not just significantly, but seemingly permanently, and I'll, I'll show you that. Um, PV prices have dropped more quickly than I thought they would, um, and distributed generation has increased quite a lot. Um, we're adding about 1,000 megawatts of PV a year. Um, although most people don't realize that two-thirds of the PV getting added is utility-scale PV. Utilities are, are still adding more than on all the rooftops, and that's projected to continue at least for the next few years by EIA. Um, but there's still rapid growth in distributed generation. And in distributed generation, in case any of you are not reading the energy blogs, that is the new, new thing. <laughs> Don't talk about the smart grid, <laughs> talk about DG. Um, and um, we'll talk about that quite a lot today. Um, the smart grid actually ran into a backlash that I didn't quite project. Uh, Ron is very familiar with this. The state regulators start, rapidly viewed it as um, a kind of a technology sandbox for a bunch of new Silicon Valley companies to make a lot of money on and um, that it wasn't providing value to their customers in the middle of a recession. They did not want to raise electricity prices or do any kind of frilly investments. It was back to basics, and they did not want to talk about how, the, the wiring your house for all of this whiz-bang technology. They wanted to keep rates low, keep the lights on. So there was a, a big backlash among state <coughs> regulators. I think that has eased quite a lot. I, I, I'd like Ron just is back from the the um, convention of, of state regulators that, that happens a couple times a year. Um, I think that has eased quite a lot, but at the same time, the industry has slowed down enormously in um, sort of the pace of its marketing to end use consumers. There's a lot going on behind the scenes that's invisible to consumers where utilities are smartening up their systems. It's less expensive. Um, you can do very good cost-benefit metrics on them, and, and those investments are, are working, and regulators are okaying them. But it's not a; it's it's much more incremental and less visible. Um, another th thing that I didn't foresee as much as has occurred is that demand response has really boomed in the last four years. This is average annual capacity growth rate since 2005. And that's minus 10%, that's 35% up there. And this is the amount of installed capacity that's out there. So the, the things that are 
installed, have very large installed base, which is gas and, and coal, because their base is installed, you can't grow more than a few percent a year. So naturally, you'd see the, the major installed <laughs> technologies growing a little bit off these very large installed bases. Conversely, back here, you see solar and wind, which have very, very small installed bases, growing at 30% average annual growth rate. Now, that's going to slow down as their base gets bigger. It's already starting to slow down. So there's no surprises here at the two bookends. But the surprise is that demand response has an installed base up at 50 gigawatts, 50,000 megawatts, the size of 50 large nuclear power plants, and it's grown at 20% a year. So that's, that's one of the surprises that uh, I have learned um, in this period. And a lot of that comes, as you know, from new markets for demand response technologies, right? In PJM here in New York and other places. Um, there's also a new driver, grid resilience, that we're going to talk about a little bit. It's more controversial, and Ron's going to talk about it, I hope. Okay, what slowed transformation? Well, um, at climate policy uncertainty here and everywhere in the world, even, even I would go so far as to even use the term backlash in Europe. I'd be interested in Jason's and David's thought on, on the use of that term. But certainly the uncertainty makes it harder to, to finance low carbon investments here and elsewhere. Um, and that's, <clears throat> that's a sad reality. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one that I should have put on here, but um, <clears throat> I didn't um, get it done in time, is cybersecurity and physical security of the grid, which is, and it, it seems to increase with every passing quarter um, in importance. The, the degree of um, attacks, uh, assaults on the grid, both from cyber sources and physical sources, continues to go up. And that understandably causes everybody to get cautious about um, rapid technological transformation. The final one uh, that I'll just mention uh, that I put down as neutral, which isn't really the best word for it. Um, <laughs> probably the best word for it is it cuts many different ways. It's not so much that it's dead center, but it cuts many different ways depending on where you are and, and frankly, where gas prices are. Um, and that's, that's the shale gas revolution, which pr particularly here in the U.S. has brought us the lowest natural gas prices in a generation and is likely to continue that at, at least for some time. Um, this is complicated, so I won't dwell on it uh, anymore. We can talk about it in the discussion period. But it has a multifaceted effect uh, on the industry. It has clearly in bought the industry a decade or so of breathing room to deal with this transformation by helping to keep rates low and easing off the financial pressure on utilities. And I will show you that right here. Um, in terms of electricity prices and demand, um, the first thing is um, uh, electric demand in the US has been decreasing really since the 1950s, since the, the high point of demand growth when, when air conditioning came in. And you can see that right here. Um, this graph, which is in many Brattle publications and, and um, uh, other, other publications, that's the trend line in demand growth rate right there, starting from 1950 out to, that's the present. And the trend line was about at 10% in 1950, and it has very steadily and smoothly, asymptotically approached zero. So it's not a particularly new phenomenon, but the fact that it's going so low is what's new. Um, U.S. summer peak demand is down uh, since the recession at six tenths of one percent. And that's what EIA forecasts going forward. Just a little bit more than that it's through 2030. So that's less than one percent growth. In, my, in the book, you can read my analysis of that, which basically says that that number is too high. That I, I expect, and many of my colleagues expect demand demand growth and sales growth to, on average by 2030 to be lower than that, particularly grid supplied electricity. Uh, and um, that there are, there are a number of utilities now in 2013 who actually have negative sales forecasts. In other words, they, they, they forecast declining sales very, very slightly 
over the next 10 to 20 years. That wasn't true in 2010, um, but I thought it was coming. Um, what has saved the industry, um, if you ask me, or as I said, given them some breathing room, is, is retail prices. And we can thank um, the state regulators who have been very conservative about approving investments. We can thank the market because the market has helped discipline prices very well. And we can thank, most of all, I think, um, cheap shale gas. But you can see that electricity prices were, were going up a little bit more before the recession. And they have really, the trend line you can see has flattened out since, through, since 2008, which is at 0.3% at, at a year in inflation adjusted terms. That's really down um, it, equal to the best days of the industry instead of uh, a financial debacle. In a moment, I'll show you Europe and I'll show you almost the opposite case. Um, but I'll show you one more, one more slide about drivers. This one is, uh, I call this the yawn slide because everybody has heard so much about this that this is not really news to anybody. See, David, David, thank you for responding to that. <laughs> U.S. solar deployment, that's in the purple bars and you can see that deployment has, has risen at that 20% average annual growth rate. We actually installed uh, almost three 1,000 megawatts of PV last year, which was kind of a banner year, but remember two-thirds of that's in, in large utility scale installations. And of course, everybody knows that PV prices have dropped dramatically, 70% since, since 2000, 50% on this chart since 2006. So there's the yawn. Um, wind is a, is a little different picture. Most of you know that wind uh, additions, first of all, that's a much bigger scale, that's 10,000 megawatts. And um, so it's 10 times the scale here. But wind generation has really been driven by uh, federal policies, in particular the production tax credit. And as that has waxed and waned, so have wind additions. But the interesting thing is that is wind price trends, which were going up through the, the Great Recession, and now have come down. And they've come down for both um, demand and supply reasons, where there's a, there's a little ease up on the industry's supply and demand, but also technology has kicked in again. And if you look at the technology studies, such as EIAs, there, um, the industry and, and the expert community um, does forecast that wind technology will continue to get incrementally better, both onshore and offshore, for many years to come. So that I would not say that wind prices have flattened out completely. We see a downward price trend. And wind is already competitive in high wind areas of the US. And, and in the world. Um, I, I won't go into all these details, but battery costs have fallen 40% since 2010. If you look at the fine print here, that's too hard to read. There's, there's still, we're still a ways off from large scale storage deployments, uh, battery type storage deployments, but incrementally it's coming in. And um, the latest uh, research that we've done, that my colleagues at Brattle and I don't see it coming in in large amounts quickly, but it will it will come into niches bit by bit, and that will only help distributed generation. <clears throat> I mentioned this this new driver. Um, I, I am fascinated by this, but it's the I have to admit it's the policy wonk in me. Um, the um, it, it is true that electric utility systems have been buffeted by storms and hurricanes since they were first built. Um, and particularly along the Gulf Coast, where hurricanes have been knocking down different portions of the power system for, for decades. Um, and they're, they're quite accustomed to putting them back up again. But from my vantage point, what happened here, right here, where we are standing and sitting about one year ago, was an, it was an inflection point for the industry. The so, the scale of the outages in the utility system here in the, in, in the mid-Atlantic part of the U.S., which is the center of power for our country and the center of media attention for our country, news media attention, um, was just unprecedented. I, I have never in my career, which goes back, sadly, 40 years, um, seen anything like the outages here. And in fact, we're, we are working now 
with public service electric and gas, and they and more than well over 90% of their electric power customers had an outage due to this one storm all at the same time. We're used to outages where 10% of customers lose power, and 20% is a huge number of, of a percentage of your customers out. To have everybody out at once, it's just, it's, uh, it's a different story. And uh, this is, is part of a trend. Um, when, when I started looking into this with actually Peter Evans, who was at, at General Electric, which was the first people to call my attention to this, they pointed out that, that there really is a trend line in severe weather events. They've increased, increased tenfold since 1992. And this, this, both the frequency and the severity have gone up. Here you see, this is a frequency chart and you can see the trend line. And the colors here are different types of storms. These are earthquakes and there's, there's no trend line in earthquakes, um, which you wouldn't expect. But, but for, uh, these are hurricanes, floods and, and storms. And you see all the growth in the trend line is from those sorts of climate driven, uh, climate change driven events. Um, you also have a, a, a big increase in droughts. And this is another way that, that electric utilities are being affected in ways that they never imagined. This, is, this chart is from the, the electric power operator in Texas known as ERCOT. And what they've had to do is look at how they're going to operate their system in very, very different ways as a result of the ongoing drought that's affecting the ability of their large power plants, which rely on cooling water to operate. So they have to derate or change the rating of those large power plants and move to other types of resources because the drought's severe enough to, to drop their the production of these plants even by 30 percent. So these are these are unprecedented changes and as we've just seen in the news yesterday sadly we had 76 tornadoes in my home state of Illinois. Um, we let um, 10, 11 days ago we had uh, super they're calling it super typhoon Haiyan which is they are now reporting the most powerful storm ever recorded wind gusts of 235 miles per hour and the fourth typhoon to hit the Philippines this year. So the operators of, uh, and the planners of electric power systems are having to think about things like what if a, a storm as serious as Sandy or even close to it hits my system, what do I need to do to rebuild very large parts of my system more quickly or harden them? And the trade-offs are new to a utility industry it, it, or to a utility regulator. I, I can't wait to hear Ron's thoughts on this, but as a policy wonk, you look at an electric utility system that's going to be hit by a storm and you're faced with, with questions that public policymakers and power economists like me have never tried to figure out. What is a better return on our public investment? Because money is very scarce. Should we harden the transmission backbone and certain high ground parts of our system, that's going to cost money. Should we actually do the opposite and let the storm knock those parts down and um, stockpile generators and create little islands of power? Is that the best way to respond to a really severe storm? Um, should we raise substations up so they don't flood or move them off the floodplain? Um, there's the we don't even yet have a full set of uh, tools to analyze which, which of these are the best options. We're just starting to do that. We've got engineering studies that are starting to be done and, and economic sort of new types of, I guess you would call them cost-benefit analyses, but they aren't the traditional cost-benefit analyses because we don't have a good set of probabilities on the, on the events. So I think this is a, a fascinating new area. You can tell, see my enthusiasm. But let's go back to, let, let's return to the, um, the world of uh, utility transformation and um, what's happening now vis-a-vis -vis 2010. If you, my, my original thesis was the combination of the 
cost of uh, decarbonization, which is adding renewables energy and taking the carbon out of the system, which I think is, is first of all, slowly in process in all, all, really all the power grids of the world, even in China, not quick enough, but it's happening, um, that the cost of doing that, retooling the transmission and distribution grid to be smart, which we, which we are starting to do mm -hmm. and will do, um, along with slow sales growth and the growth of distributed generation was really going to put utilities into financial duress. And, elect, and at least in the four years since I wrote the book, utilities in the US are not in financial distress. They were helped by low shale gas prices, low interest rates, and other things. But in Europe, to, to my surprise, um, the, my, the, the scenario that I painted to a large degree has come true. Europe moved much more aggressively to decarbonize through adding renewable energy. Many of you know that. And um, distributed generation has grown much more quickly. And, and as a result, prices have gone up much more quickly. Sales growth has tapered off there just as much as it has here. So you have virtually no sales growth, much higher costs, uh, more, uh, more of the growth being diverted to distributed generation. And the utilities there are in um, unprecedented financial distress. Um, and that's what these charts illustrate. Here you have, this is, this is amazing. Uh, this is total world distri distributed generation installed. And here's how much is in Europe, which is the lion's share has gone into Europe. Um, as I mentioned, electricity prices have risen, um, not, not necessarily because renewables are so much more expensive, but they also had to be integrated into the grid very quickly. Lots of transmission had to be built. Um, and also at this, um, uh, many nuclear plants have been shut down in Europe. So there's, a, there's very rapid transformation. And as a result, Europe's prices, these, this is OECD Europe's, prices indexed at 100 in 2005 have gone up 35%, whereas Japan was pretty much flat until Fukushima when they had to start importing expensive natural gas. And the US, us lucky folks in the US with cheap shale gas, our trend line since 2005 is down, just as I showed you on the other chart. So the result is that bond ratings of utilities, this is the aggregate utility sector so as an aggregate whole, um, the utility sector, which I grew up and m most investors right up the street on Wall Street at the other end of the island, grew up seeing as one of the safest bedrock investments in all of the American economy. The EU average utility sector is now down at triple B, junk, beginning junk level. That, that's the, there's the average right there. <clears throat> so this is the this is the scenario. So let me now turn to um, what utilities are doing to respond to this, and then we can hopefully get to uh, the responders and the questions. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that utilities are doing it immediately to respond to. I say increased distributed generation, but really of the, all of the all of the factors hitting them most visibly and and viscerally to them. I think uh, it's DG that's driving this. The first thing is decoupling, and uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I'll just describe it very simply. It's a formulaic readjustment of of, of electric rates to recoup. Um, the profits that you've lost in case your sales have gone down from energy efficiency or perhaps distributed, losing sales to distributed generation. So it's a way of restoring the utility's financial health by letting it increase its rates a little bit automatically using a formula. Um, it's, um, there's 17 states that have it. Here you can see the map, some with both electric and gas, some with gas only and some electric only. Um, but this, this approach, um, it, is, it's a perfectly good idea, but it own, in my opinion, it's not enough to, to accommodate this transformation. Pretty soon you have to keep doing the formula and updating rates, and you're sort of chasing your tail, and it's politically quite unpopular 
because it's seen as a profit guarantee for utilities who shouldn't have a profit guarantee. The utility should, should um, under sound regulatory principles, perform well and then get their profits, their fair, just, and reasonable profits. It shouldn't be formulaically awarded to them. And I'm sure Ron can talk more about that. So there, I say there, there's some pushback um, against it, but there's also a sense that this isn't enough to deal with the transformation of Spain. There's other rate structure changes that are going on in, in utilities. Um, and this is very current. I, I'm sure Ron got an earful about this from uh, the neighborhood conference. Um, but in broad form, um, the direction of all of these rate changes that utilities are pushing for are to increase the fixed portion of a consumer's uh, average monthly bill and um, lower the variable rate. Every one of you who pays an electric or, or a gas bill at retail, if you look on it, there is an annual, there, uh, there is a monthly, it's usually called a customer charge. And then there's a charge that's based on how much you use. And the customer charge in most utilities is two or three dollars a month across most of the US. It's higher in rural electric co-ops um, quite significantly for reasons we won't go into. But utilities are looking at raising that um, or other sorts of rate design changes that are of that nature. Um, and of course, those rate design changes, as you can imagine, really impair the economics of putting rooftop solar on your house. Because the idea of rooftop solar and selling the power back to the utility is that you lower your power bill by selling a lot of power back. But if your power bill has a big fixed charge on it that doesn't change with how much you use, you don't lower that fixed charge. You just keep paying it whether you have a rooftop solar on your house or not. Well, that's exactly what the utilities are trying to achieve. They're trying to stop their revenue erosion and make enough money to keep themselves whole. But then it's less economical for you to put a solar system on your house because you're not saving as much money. So the solar industry, of course, is very opposed to the, these sorts, this direction of rate structure changes. And this is, this is really the hottest, most contentious topic really everywhere in the country where there's significant penetration of distributed generation. And it's even, it's spreading into the parts of the country where there isn't significant penetration because they, those utilities see this coming. So this is the, I think, the most contentious um, topic now in the, in the industry. But there's other, there's other changes going on um, that, that utilities are adapting. Uh, I mentioned, uh, I've mentioned some of these. Uh, there's decoupling, there's the changes in rate design. We just talked about them. In some cases, utilities are, are, are trying to change the, the, the policy supports for distributed generation or demand response in order to just kind of maintain their sales. Um, there's quite a lot of um, shutting old inefficient power plants, which is a good thing. Um, and even some sales, quite a lot of sales of power plants. You all probably don't follow it, but in my business, there's quite an active churn in utility assets. And in Europe, where we saw utilities have sunk to, to junk ratings and have lost half their market value. You, the util, since 2005, the European utilities w had market cap of a trillion dollars and have lost half a trillion dollars and now have a market cap of 500 billion. They have, they have un, uh, embarked on very significant uh, programs to, to sell and shutter plants. So shedding assets is very significant and, and it's starting to happen in this country where you see Exelon, a very large generator with very high fixed costs, starting to shut its single unit nuclear plants, which are very expensive to maintain and conserve and slashing its capital budget. And that's all public. You can read about it in their investor presentations. Um, on the positive side, utilities are getting into uh, renewables and distributed generation quite significantly. I think that trend will continue for quite some time. Um, I'm sorry about this. I don't know what happened here, but that's the headline of the Wall Street Journal 
talking about utilities weighing a turn to the sun, talking about that. And, and then um, to kind of finish up, uh, the, the utilities are starting to think about new business and regulatory models. Um, and that was really the ultimate point of the book, was to say to the industry, with all of these changes, the, the, cur the utility regulatory and business model which was basically selling um, a homogeneous commodity, kilowatt hours, on a per kilowatt hour basis without any product differentiation or anything more than just two or three different rates, one for residential and one for commercial and maybe one for government, um, that that was much too simple a business model. It worked for the first 100 years. It won't work for the next, next 100 years. And um, now there, I, I'm gratified to see, uh, four years after writing the book, that there is um, an enormous amount of uh, discussion about this. We haven't quite seen the, the new business models emerge yet. No, no, no utility yet has quite um, actually piloted one. I hope we are on the cusp of doing that. And you'll see I, I recommend that. But the, the, just as a reminder, the, the two business models that I talked about in the book that I still think are in very, very big picture uh, form, the, the, the models that I think people are talking about are what I call the smart integrator, which means that the utility really provides grid services and grid management services. It thinks of that as its business. It, it, it takes what is now viewed as very simple uh, plain vanilla power service to you, and it de, de aggregates that, disaggregates that into all, many, many different services that the industry's just always bundled together and never really thought about how to price them all separately. But it, I, I think we are now starting to get the analytic tools and, and the appetite to disaggregate those services, price them separately, and have the utility provide that and have people understand that that's the business it's in. It's not in the business of selling you more and more kilowatt hours with every passing year, which it used to be. So I think that's the dominant model emerging. I talked, about, I talked also about the energy services utility. Interestingly, um, the, the cooperative community is showing more interest in that, in that than the investor-owned community. But the idea there is that utilities view their product as light and heat and screen hours and the actual services that you get from electri electricity, not the electricity itself. Um, and there are models in which uh, utilities and other companies sell these energy services um, and it could take over in part of the industry, but it's more likely, I think, that we'll go in a smart integrator direction. Um, What's lagging? This is very simple. We need a, we need a carbon policy in this country and, and in this world uh, that would include a price on it or at least a shadow price. Um, I think that due to the complexity of these changes, I think um, policymakers need more tools and more resources to cope with them. I'd be interested in Ron's thoughts on that. Um, I don't think the federal government is nearly as engaged on this topic as it could or should be. I'd be interested in David, David and Jason are two of the best people we could find to comment on that. And I know I've talked to them about this many times, but I don't see a lot of, I, I, there is definitely awareness of this in, uh, in, in Washington, um, but I think there's the federal government and the Obama administration still searching for the best ways to engage, and of course, a resolution of this contentious war of the rate structures I talked about. So the conclusion, um, the transformation's clearly happening, and it's happening faster than I thought it would. Um, I, I don't know whether that's good or bad, but it's not really for us to judge. Um, it's going to happen. Um, we haven't quite yet seen actual examples of the new business model emerge. Um, but I think we are getting closer and closer. Um, and I think many, many more regulators and governors and um, everyone in the industry is much more conversant on this and willing to think about it. 
I, I said we, we need a price on carbon. I'll keep saying that till we have one. Uh, <clears throat> there's very deep unresolved questions about um, legacy costs and maintaining universal service. There's a danger in this transformation that, as in so many other systems in this country, um, we forget about universal service and the safety net. And uh, we do have uni close to universal service in electricity and gas service. And I hope we can continue to do that. And, and just finally, I, I want to say a few words about a phrase that's often used, and I think it's greatly a, an exaggeration, and that is that the utilities are in a death spiral. Um, as, uh, they, they're certainly going to um, undergo financial challenges, but uh, we are going to need a functioning grid, a central grid, for several decades to come. It may not be more than several decades, but we're going to need them for several decades. And as a result, we're going to need utilities to stay around, and I think they will stay around. These, these challenges are, are very tough, but I think they are navigable, and I think that there is actually agreement on that everywhere in the industry. So with that, I thank you very, very much for your kind attention, and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks to everybody at the uh, program here for the invitation. I, I've been looking forward to this for uh, uh, quite a while now. And um, um, I took out my lap, my uh, tablet here. How many of you know uh, Ellie Nome? Some of you? He's at CITI, okay? Columbia Institute for Teleinformation, I think is what it's called, right here at Columbia. Um, Ellie is a first adopter. He always he had a laptop before anybody else had a laptop. And uh, we didn't know what it was. We really didn't know what it was. And what he did, he would come in and give a speech. He'd set his laptop up here. And he had written some software that allowed his speech to go down the screen. And it was sophisticated, in those days very sophisticated, in that he could uh, program how long he wanted to talk, and then it would scroll the screen at the right speed to have him show up. If he had seven minutes, he had seven minutes. What he didn't account for is questions. He'd get interrupted and he'd have to recalibrate and then talk faster for the next bit of time. And he got interrupted again and pretty soon he's talking so fast you couldn't understand what he was talking about. <laughs> so I'm no Ellie Gnome though. Um, I want to comment just on a few things that Peter said. Um, as a general matter, I, I, as always, agree with Peter. That's one of his problems. He's almost always right. <laughs> and um, so um, the first thing I want to say is I, I don't know what the audience is here. As all of you uh, came because you thought there would be something valuable today, I guess. Uh, I assume some of you, most of you, well, let me ask you this. How many have not read Smart Power? Oh, Peter, look, sign them, sign them outside. Um, I highly recommend it. You will become a most literate thinker about energy if you read this book and understand what Peter, and it's accessible. Um, not a lot of uh, economics graphs in there. It's an accessible book. Peter did uh, the industry, all of us, a great um, um, a favor by writing this book. It's uh, informed a lot of people's thinking over the years, mine included. So I tend to agree with what he has said. In fact, for the last year, I've been working on the issue of the evolving utility business model. I have a little different take than he does on what will motivate it. Um, I, I, but I want to just now populate some comments with a few reactions and points uh, that um, either uh, uh, support or modify things Peter has said. Uh, first of all, his own consultancy, the Brattle Group, um, has, uh, since 2008, predicted that the utility industry is going to invest about $2 trillion in the next two decades. Now, that's more or less twice the run rate of what they've had in the, uh, the 2000s. 
and we're beginning to see a ramp up of that. Now, just to give you a sense, the entire market capitalization, or the entire capitalization of the utility industry is about $1.1 billion. So that's more than twice what they're worth right now, or about twice what they're worth they're going to be investing. So that's another uh, pressure on the utilities. Notwithstanding all the other changes that he talked about, uh, flattened load growth, um, uh, more move towards um, uh, distributed generation, the utilities um, by most estimates, are going to remain very important and, more importantly, be called upon to raise and spend a lot of capital. Um, I want to just motivate that one curve that he showed that showed the 1950s rates year-over-year -year growth and it tailed off and leveled out and it's kind of at about a 0.8 percent now uh, and projected to be for the long run. Um, why, I think we can give a little bit of grounding to that. Has anyone in this room, and I realize there's a lot of students who probably don't buy refrigerators, but has anybody in the room bought a new refrigerator in the last five years? Okay, a few people. Do you have any sense of the wattage of a refrigerator now? You know, you got your ice maker and you got your lettuce crisper and all those kinds of things. The refrigerator uses less energy than this light bulb does around the clock, about 60 watts, actually a little bit under 60 watts. Um, remarkable. I mean, that's, and that's a change which is never going to be reversed. Nobody's ever going to go buy an inefficient refrigerator and install it in their house. More inefficient ones keep going away. In fact, one of the more effective utility uh, energy efficiency programs is buying for 50 bucks old refrigerators and letting people go out or giving them rebates on new ones. So there's no reason to think that that trend is ever going to reverse itself. Ditto for light bulbs themselves. I just replaced uh, two years ago all of the incandescent lights in my house with not twisties but with LEDs. And that cut my lighting load in those lit, lit spaces by 82 percent. Oh, no, 92 percent, sorry, 8 percent remaining. Um, so those are fundamental changes which are going to have to be accommodated by utilities and their regulators. Um, I want to uh, point out uh, several times Peter talked about the lack of a carbon price policy, even a policy in this country. It, you know, some states have it. The Northeast has uh, the, the uh, REGI, the uh, um, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Um, but there's something coming down the road that Peter didn't mention. And if you remember nothing else from what I said, and if you don't know what I'm about to tell, if you don't recognize what I'm about to tell you, look it up. It's an alphanumeric called 111D. That's a section of the Clean Air Act the EPA is about to invoke in order to uh, establish carbon emission limits for existing power plants. Uh, I think that will, more than anything we've talked about today, remake this industry over the next couple decades. I see no reason to think the EPA will not proceed with it. There will be legal challenges every step of the way. They always are dogged by uh, lawsuits. But uh, a lot of us think that it uh, promises to uh, really uh, remove the thumb on the scale for carbon resources and allow clean resources to compete more fully with those. Um, Peter talked about um, uh, several trends in pricing. I just want to mention a couple of them. I want to uh, sort of refer to a couple of those. One is the uh, price trend, or the cost trend, I should say, for wind. Um, he alluded to this fact, but um, most of the studies that project wind costs over the next uh, 20 years show 20 to 30 percent real price reductions in uh, wind pr prices. Um, that, coupled with the uh, very rapid fall in solar prices, is remaking utilities thinking about the use of those uh, heretofore kind of suspect resources. Even the most staid and stodgy um, 
uh, utilities are now beginning to look seriously at um, those resources. So I think that is going to continue and it will be abetted by, that trend will be abetted by the, uh, what I think will be a, a, a shadow price on carbon. Uh, smart grid is a really interesting topic. Um, I've written, Peter's written lots about it. Um, I refer to the smart grid stages of grief. Okay, you all know the Kubler-Ross stages of grief. Well, we've had something similar in smart grid. First, we had wonder, and then maybe promise. Very quickly, we got the hype. That that lasted quite a while. Then we crashed. Uh, it was no good at all. And now I think we're kind of back to the acceptance phase. Um, I think smart grid, um, which is no more or less than the application of IT to the electric industry, the same abilities and pressures and uh, enabling that uh, it, that uh, uh, the uh, internet revolution has brought us to banking, information, communications, entertainment, I mean, everything we do except with respect to our use of energy services, everything we do has been remade by that. And it's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of whether, it's a matter of when that's going to happen. Um, I'm going to mention as I wrap up um, a couple things that I think have to um, happen to sort of uh, speed that up. And I think uh, much of that is in the hands of regulators. Uh, Peter spent some time talking about resilience and the response to um, uh, Hurricane Sandy and, and other events. Uh, I'm not as sanguine as he is about uh, the industry's uh, response to that. I think it's going to be more incremental. Um, you can't go to a meeting these days without finding the word resilience in the agenda of the meeting. It's, it's what everybody's talking about. But when you start getting serious about the costs of hardening the grid, undergrounding, it's astronomical, those costs. I mean, these two trillion that we're talking about doesn't contemplate the sort of hardening of the grid that would be required if you followed out that. I think there will be some selective changes. Uh, Peter mentioned some of them getting substations out of the lowlands and, and up uh, so they're not flooded. But I think the, the and, and hardening or uh, making it possible to reroute and repair the transmission system more effectively. I think that will happen. I don't suspect that there will be a huge change in the distribution system, certainly not the not most of the aerial um, cable. Uh, it's simply um, going to be deemed, I think, not only by regulators, but by anyone in decision-making capacity, town councils and everything else, as just not economic. You would have to harden the entire eastern seaboard um, with the possibility of a, another Sandy coming in. Uh, so we'll see where that goes. Um, I think hardening single sources of failure that affect a lot, that, that certainly makes sense. But I think the farther you get out to the distribution network, the less likely we're going to find we're able to afford that. Um, I said that I had a little different take on the evolution of the electric industry. Um, clearly, uh, pressure from these um, technological changes, um, the, uh, the environmental regulations, all of those are conspiring to require the industry to think about itself differently. But that is very much retarded, the, any kind of movement, by regulatory inaction in the following sense. I'm of the opinion that the regulatory system that we use in this country is not up to the task of um, leading or even permitting the transformation of the industry. Um, I'm uh, a former regulator and kind of like a former smoker, probably. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see the problems. And um, so my advocacy has been for a, a, a type of regulation which rewards utilities for the types of behavior we want society wants them to undertake. Uh, that sounds pretty obvious that you know you would do that if you were in a position, um, but that that isn't how regulation typically functions right now. Um, it, it does more so in the United Kingdom and in some other places around the world. In fact, Peter has a um, 
topically has an article in this fortnight's public utility fortnightly, if I'm right, or was it last fortnight, um, about a system in the UK that's used for regulation. It's something that I uh, hope uh, we begin to see some movement towards that um, from um, utility commissions in this country. That's one of the things uh, I'll be working with, uh, working on in the next couple of years. Um, the, P Peter said something tonight I haven't heard before, and I, again, I agree with it, and that is that the big fight, the big picture change, has kind of resolved to a small canvas fight over rate structures. That's where it's at right now. And Peter's absolutely right. Um, you can't, again, go to a meeting. You can't go to a state that doesn't have utility insisting that solar is being subsidized and we need to move to a different rate structure so that the cost of the grid is paid for by the users of the grid and so forth and so on. Um, I think there's several, I don't know if there's ways out of this. Somebody's going to lose. Um, uh, it's kind of like... Um, it's kind of like a civil war. We've now got these battles. They've got names. You know, there was the Arizona decision just a week ago. Um, there was the uh, decision of Georgia Power to pull out of a high fixed charge application just two days ago or something like that. You don't know that one? Yeah. They abandoned an attempt in Georgia. So um, it's a big deal, and somebody I think is eventually going to lose. But there's one thing I'm beginning to pick up that I think may ameliorate this for the utilities. Um, Peter said that the electric co-ops are actually on the margin on this or on the lead on this. Um, I have just as of last week a new client. It's a rural electric company who wants to massively put solar on the customer side of the meter for their service territory. Okay. Um, it's in a good solar zone. Um, prices are still higher than um, carbon-based uh, 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 generation, which is what they buy from their generation and transmission supplier. But they're looking long term. They're thinking we can use our low costs of capital to get in and take advantage of the uh, very sharply falling solar prices. If that trend, first, if it's a trend at all, but if that continues, I think you're going to be seeing utilities one by one, and I mean investor-owned utilities, begin to think about jumping on the other side of the meter. And that's a type of service utility. It's not providing what they usually provide. It's providing electricity to the customer, but through a customer-sided system. Really, a, a, for you know, again, that probably doesn't excite you all that much, but that is a radical shift for utilities to get in their heads. Um, I hope they don't see resistance because I'm actually much in favor of utilities using their balance sheets to fund a, a lot of new solar. I think that that will be a good thing for this country. And um, there may well be resistance from some regulators who don't, or, and there absolutely will be uh, opposition from some in the solar industry who don't want to see the big dogs get into their market. But um, it's a growing pie. It's a pie that's growing very fast. So I'm not too worried about um, working that out. Um, I look forward to questions from the from all of you uh, about this. Um, as I said, um, and, and, and I haven't said, but as I will sum up, I think um, uh, it, there's always a um, uh, tendency, if you, especially if you're 64 years of age like me and you want to see this stuff happen before you check out, uh, there's always a, a, a tendency to uh, expect things to happen or to, to predict things to happen maybe a little faster than they do. Uh, that said, um, if you look at some of the underlying trends um, and just uh, and what the estimates have been for those, distributed generation is a very good example of that. Um, cost of wind is another very good example of that. Um, if you look at those trends, those are real. And if you think they have implications, it won't be that much longer before those implica implications are manifest. As a commissioner in Colorado, the last wind project I approved in eastern Colorado, uh, I don't know, again, if, if these numbers mean anything to you, but the price of the wind was $27 a megawatt hour. It was from a wind farm with a 50% capacity factor. Now that's barely intermittent. <laughs> that's that's a lot of uh, a lot of wind up, up a lot of the time. 
Um, and so we're, the technology there is charging forward, and I think uh, uh, the, the, the trends uh, will probably continue to exceed expectations. Uh, that's all I've got. Uh, I, well, not all I've got. I'm going to uh, sit tight and uh, look for questions. And uh, uh, again, thanks to Rebecca Columbia for the invitation. Thanks. It's, uh, it's very humbling to follow Peter Fox Penner and Ron Binns on a panel talking about utility issues. <laughs> Uh, Peter literally wrote the book, and if you haven't read his book, I highly recommend that you read it. Uh, and Ron, is, his talk just demonstrated, is one of our nation's leading experts in this area. The nation is uh, at a loss for him not um, serving um, in the federal government today. Um, and to appear with Travis Bradford, who's also one of the leading experts in this country. So uh, my expertise, as I will demonstrate, um, is much less than any of theirs on this topic. But, but let me just make three quick observations in the form of questions, and then we can get to a broader conversation. And, and I want to just, let me, uh, for the, my first observation, start with some audience participation and a question. And I want to ask a variation on the question Ron asked about refrigerators, and ask how many people in this audience believe that you know how much it costs to run your, elect run your refrigerator on electricity, say, for a year, plus or minus $25? <laughs> Anybody? OK. This is a group self-selected for their interest and probably expertise uh, in, in the top of the street. Not one person, let the record show, raise their hand um, to suggest that they think they know how much it costs to run their refrigerator on electricity for a year. I, I had an experience that's relevant to this just in the past month. I got my, I got my electric bill at my home in Washington, D.C. Uh, for, I guess it was a period of September through early October. Um, and it was twice as high as the comparable period for a year ago. And I looked at it, and I said, this has got to be wrong. Um, but looked at the meter, actually, and it, I couldn't figure out why it was wrong. Um, and start, I, I scratched my head. I, I thought about weather, and the only thing I could think of, the weather wasn't dramatically different. Um, from year to year, and, and I know we have a few electric baseboard heaters in our house that sometimes get left on for a long time, so I went to check those, and they were off, and there actually hadn't been anybody around, or I couldn't figure it out. Um, and just two weeks ago, almost by accident, I happened to stumble upon our air conditioning fan in the basement, which is in a corner, so I didn't think to go look there. And there were huge blobs of ice off of our, our fan, just sitting there. Um, and what I realized had happened, I then went to the air conditioning unit, which sits outside, which was spinning. And I realized, that, and, but, the, but the fan was broken. The air conditioning cooling unit was spinning and blowing cold air into the fan, which was then not distributing it through the house. But I had no idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and nor would I have any way to know, because there was nothing happening in my house. And the only visible sign of this was ice, which I happened to see. That is a bizarre situation, uh, and and it is. And, and when you contrast that with our, and what's, what was odd about that, just to highlight what I think is odd about that, is is that here I am. This is one of the major bills that I pay every month in my house, and it's jumping up to twice what it normally is. But there is no mechanism for me to know that that is Why? happening, yeah. um, and that contrasts dramatically, of course, with our gasoline stations which blare on every corner minute changes in the price of this particular fuel. But electricity is a fuel we just don't have that tool available to us. Um, but I think with technology available now, we actually have the ability to know that. And so the first question I want to raise is, will the consumer's relationship with electricity change significantly in the next decade um, as a result of some of, these, uh, some of the tools that are available? One, this isn't exactly on point, but, but the fastest growing company in the United States today, I am told, is a company called Nest. And Nest, as some people here know, ma makes the, uh, it, it, created by, by a man named Tony Fidel, who along with Steve Jobs created the iPod. And he's using the iPod dial pad for home thermostat. Um, and uh, it allows, it also has some smart features built into it. And it's extraordinary the, t the uptake they're getting on this unit. And, and I think th there are now devices and the possibility of more devices, I mean, I'll put this in a question form, that 
could provide a tool for customers without going to the utilities and trying to get these things you know, done on the utility, utilities bills, go into their home, buy them, and have a better understanding of your electricity consumption so you don't get faced with the situation that I just had last month and you really know what you're consuming. Um, and so the, a question I would throw out to Peter and Ron as experts is, is the relationship between the consumer and electricity uh, going to change over, over, the, over the decade ahead? Um, there, there has been, as, as Ron put it, kind of a grief, uh, state, different state of grief on the smart grid. But I wonder whether technologies that are available to us in the next decade are fundamentally different than that, whether we have tools. Kind of, we, we, right now we have tools that can you know, plug into the wall and can discern the, the energy draw from individual appliances in the home based upon voltage readings. Um, do we have the tools for the consumer's relationship to electricity to change? That's my first question. Second question is very different than that, but it's, I'm really struck by listening to Peter's presentation, which is, why are U.S. utility valuations so high today? Um, I'm interested in some thoughts on that. Um, it, uh, I did a little bit of looking before this talk, and, and today the average P.E. ratio for utilities in, in the S&P 500 index is about 16, around 16, which is higher by the by three dollars actually, that, or, or by three points, not three dollars, than than the historic average P.E. ratio, which is about 13. Um, I did a little bit of looking on this, and and the expert, the kind of blog posts that I picked up, say that this is because um, bond yields are so low, um, and so investors are looking for higher yields that are available from what are perceived to be the safe assets. Um, but uh, the, the question is, in light of some of the trends that Peter was pointing out, are these assets really as safe um, as the investment community thinks that they are? Or are we, are we, is there at least a risk that we're headed into another Europe situation that, that Peter was pointing to? I, I don't know. I'm not enough of an expert to say, but this, you know, and there's the view that markets are always efficient, so they always price in any risk. This was exactly the debate between the two winners, two of the winners of the last Nobel Prize in economics. Um, but um, Robert Schiller and Eugene Fama, but, but but I, I think it's an interesting question whether the markets are failing to take account of some of the risks in the current U.S. utility sector that are associated with increasing deployment of PVs and other distributed generation. It, I, it, I wonder if it's a fair summary of some of what Peter said, that, that what has saved the utility industry financially in the past five years has been cheap shale gas, um, and that, or has been a driving factor in the utility's performance. And as natural gas prices trend upwards, which is the projection from most experts over the years ahead, and you combine that with distributed generation, um, is the utility sector as safe as it seems to be? Um, that's, so that's the second question. The third question, which I think is a very disturbing one, but, but one that concerns me a lot, is whether cyber attacks will be the new, new thing on the cyber grid. And Peter mentioned this. I think this, that's the one issue um, uh, that in real, that I think in between the combination of Peter and Ron's talks did not get as much attention as perhaps the importance that it has. Um, th this is a th significant vulnerability that, um, that our nation faces. We have determined adversaries um, who are looking for any means to um, uh, cause us harm. And this is a vector which has got um, a lot of experts extremely concerned. Um, at the U.S. Department of Energy over the last couple of years um, in working with the White House, um, we paid a lot of attention um, to, to this issue um, and to trying, uh, to trying to address it. Um, but there is no question that, that the vulnerability is, is serious and it remains. We have, um, in the banking sector, we've had persistent um, DDoS, that's distributed denial of service attacks. Um, uh, and in the utility sector, there's, there's the risk of the same. And I wonder what more, um, uh, what would be the impact, for example, of an outage of the scale that happened here with Hurricane Sandy, but caused by some type of cyber attack um, on the U.S. utility industry. And is that a black swan event? Or is that an event which at this point is foreseeable and that we need to be taking account of and investing heavily in prevention of? Um, so with that very serious question, I want to actually close with a final tongue-in-cheek question, which is to take Peter to task for failing to highlight one hugely important issue on the grid, which is the impact of squirrels and outages <laughs> on the grid. Um, I bring this to your attention because there was a wonderful article in the New York Times this summer 
which if you didn't see it, I recommend going and finding, um, by somebody who, a um, man whose name is John Muella, to give him credit, um, was, as he wrote, was struck by the fact uh, when he read about a squirrel taking down a local power grid and power being out for 12 hours, wondered how many times this happened. And so he, using modern technology, put squirrel power outage into his Google News alert um, and was surprised to find over the next two months 50 power outages in 24 states. And as he noted, those were only the ones that made news stories. Um, and actually, it, it kind of ended up with a, I thought, a nice point in this piece, which is the, uh, which is the point I'll close with, which is the expectation of ubiquity of electricity today. Um, that, you know, that squirrels are, after all, the natural order. Um, and natural, but, but, uh, but now it's, we, we think of the electric grid as what's natural um, and expected to be everywhere all the time. And when a squirrel takes it down, we consider it you know, to be an extraordinary thing. But, um, uh, but uh, we are dealing right now with a, a system that's hugely, you know, hugely important to all of our lives, as, this, as Hurricane Sandy demonstrated a year ago. I'm honored to talk after these guys and look forward to Travis's comments as well. Thanks. Our slow descent. Um, we have. Uh, we now have ten minutes. So fortunately, I won't be making any comments. Um, uh, I will be trying. Just ask. Uh, trying to in the next. Uh, what do I have seven minutes. Um, oh no, 12, 12 whole minutes. I have to ask questions. Uh, bring in our, our the folks who are uh, sending in questions over the Twitter feed, and uh, and then we have. Let's see. We have to get the answers to David's questions, and then you all may have some questions. So. I figure about a minute a piece for each of those things. I'm going to try to wrap up two of those if I can. I I, I will I will pass. Over, I will uh, if you will excuse my my uh, lack of accolades. Um, I, I I could go on for way more than 12 minutes with how much I appreciate all of your participation in this in this conversation today. And as we are at this fulcrum in the in the in the societal discussion of where to go next, um, it's an honor to be working with you to try to come up with some reasonable and thoughtful solutions. One of the things that, that strikes me, there's an implicit assumption, and Peter, you, you, you and, and this comes, there's also a question from one of the listeners, uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Raghu uh, Sudhakara, who's a uh, alum and uh, is in the energy sector now. So, but I wanna sort of paraphrase this question because it dovetails with what I wanna ask. Peter, you, you talked about that there is a natural need for the grid for some de decades to come. Um, I think for a lot of people, particularly in the utility industry, there is this, um, you know, David, to your point about natural, um, the natural existence of the grid. It has been with us for so long. It has been the backbone of our economic development. Um, but we felt that way about landline telecommunications once, too. And w there are a number of factors that I'm very concerned about in this, and we don't have to call it a utility death spiral, but what we will is call entering into a competitive environment. And in competition, the outcomes are not always certain. And so, and, and, and in this new environment, I mean, obviously there's a transformation from a very centralized, uh, cent centralized generation and distribution grid to something more distributed. Is it possible that that transformation continues essentially to the end? That it, that it keeps going. And, and one of the reasons I ask this is one of the top utility people in the country, uh, David Crane from NRG, who's very outspoken about that the, most of the responses from the utility industry that you all have talked about actually make their competitive situation worse. They, if they change their rate structures, then customers are going to be paying more, and that's going to cause them to want to do things, generate and store locally differently. It, will all, it could also, to his point, and those of manufacturers is from residential fuel cell systems in Japan to Bloom Energy in the United States, which is, if this natural gas stuff is so cheap, why don't we just put fuel cells on site? There are a number of ways that we might find that the competitive pressures are absolute. Um, I know you may have different opinions on that, but um, where, if, if there were a place for the utilities to kind of defend its territory and, and find its natural competitive advantage in this transformation, where would that be? And, and, and how far from the, wh where we are today does that occur? Well, <clears throat> excellent question. And um, not, not nearly as much fun as talking about the ice machine in David's basement. Um, uh, you, the, 
the indication of, of, of where I think the utility strengths are are probably suggested by the business models that I recommend uh, as that's sort of suggesting for them to go into uh, lines of work where uh, they can be successful. Their core competencies are strong. Um, there's a sustainable revenue stream for at least the next couple decades. And um, they uh, need not uh, ride off into the sunset, and I think will not. Um, so there, they are, utilities are, uh, I think, overall remarkably good at operating the system. We do have 99% reliable electricity here. We've had it for many years. And electric power grids are unbelievably complicated things to manage there because there's essentially no storage on them. So they are matching um, aggregate demand and aggregate supply in every single building right here on Manhattan Island with much of the power from, that we are using right here being shipped all the way from places like Niagara Falls in Canada. It's just, it's astounding. And it's, it's for good reason that um, the engineering profession, the National Academy of Engineering, declared the power grid to be the single most remarkable invention of the 20th century. Um, managing that power grid as it, as more and more people do generate their own power, uh, electricity um, and the smart grid comes in and lots of other changes occur. All of these changes, actually managing it is going to be much more complex, um, but it's something that I think is going to be extremely valuable as long as we need a grid. As long as we can't all survive on our own electric power, we're going to need a wire into that grid, and we are going to be willing to pay for it. Believe me, you can put a solar panel on your house, but I do not think anyone in this room is going to want to get off the grid. Maybe, maybe one or two of you, but not I doubt it. Um, and that's, I think, 50 years from now, Travis, I don't think there will be a large-scale grid like we have. But for 20 or 30 years, we're really going to need it. And managing that grid, I think, is something that utilities are, are good at now, and they can evolve their competencies, get paid for it, and make us, I think, all better off. Okay. Yeah, sure. I jump in. Uh, it's, in uh, it's interesting that utilities are good at managing today's grid, but Peter, I wonder the question is, are they good at the evolution or revolution that will be coming and managing that? And do you think utilities have that skill set? Well, on, on an engineering basis, yes. But part of the new grid is, is creating the new business model and behaving differently, pricing differently, um, interacting with the customer differently. That is such a change in the, the business model and the DNA of utilities that, no, I think that is, that's where the question is. Can they... Can they run a business that does, that does this because it's going to be different than the business that they have today? My image of the grid some number of years out, I'll be in specific about that, is kind of like the internet where every input and output of the grid is connected to every other one. You're literally, your refrigerator will provide regulation service to the grid. You won't know it won't be called that, but it will be... You, Think of how little you know about the internet, <laughs> but how much you rely on it. And I think we're going to have a similar uh, architectural distinction there. Um, while distributed generation is um, uh, uh, really on the rampage right now, that's going to top out at some number. You're not going to have distributed generation serving aluminum smelters. <laughs> I mean, you're not, and probably it's not office. The hydroelectric dam. <laughs> yeah, but but you're right there too. But but you know, the sort of rooftop, the fuzzy rooftop solar system. That's applicable a lot of places for a lot of you know people. But when you start looking at the aggregate of the demand, it's going to be. I don't. It's going to top out thirty or forty percent, something like that. I don't know what the number is, and I'm perfectly prepared to be wrong, but my guess is that we're not going to repeal the economies of scale. 
uh, even though those are mitigated by transmission and distribution costs, that sort of thing. So I think there's going to be a grid for a very long time. I, I, I think it's long enough that we don't need to uh, bother ourselves talking about its demise right now. Uh, if anyone's got questions, please, the microphone is up here. Yeah, you, you'll need to use the microphone so that we can get your question uh, immortalized. <laughs> And please state your name and affiliation. Uh, hi, uh, Ken Kramer, uh, Columbia B School alumnus. Uh, my firm, Rush Then Atlantic, is, uh, provides valuation services to the energy industry. Um, this was a great panel. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I would wondering to see if the what if the question was going to be answered. You know, what does an, an IOU look like in 30 years? And I, I don't think we're quite that smart yet. But with regard to the type of uh, adaptation that, that the utilities and utility managements make over the next decade or two, say, what are people's collective sense of the inclination and ability of utility managements to run unregulated businesses? You know, 10 years ago with, or a little more, with um, uh, generation deregulation, you know, you had a bunch of utility managements champing at the bit, assuming that the regulated, regulated rate of return uh, was a ceiling on what they could really make, and then they overpaid for a bunch of assets, and it turns out in some cases it was a floor. So to the extent that, for example, utilities want to supply, uh, uh, you know, rooftop solar units as well, um, and then they go into competition with solar city, so, you know, they can't use a rate-based model. Is, is that sort of thing in the future, and do you think they'll be able to pull it off? And, and I'll, let me extend that question, because, Ron, you talked about stranded assets in one of your recent uh, reports, and I think that the question, the, the extension, and an extension of the question is, um, to how much exposure is there in the stranded assets for these investments? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> right, I'll, take to, I'll try to talk a little bit about the first one. Um, I, I, the, the, uh, you're absolutely right that um, the uh, history of utilities going into unregulated um, industries, which they did in the 70s and 80s, most of them were not very successful and ended unhappily. Um, I think this time will be a little bit different for a couple reasons. Number one, um, whereas it was uh, a luxury then, I think it's a necessity now, and they will have to be better at it. Uh, I guess there's maybe three reasons. Second of all is I think the border between regulated and unregulated activities is, has been getting more and more complex and porous. We, we, we don't regulate, for example, the price of retail electricity here in in New York and in many other parts of the country, but there's quite a lot of regulation surrounding that. The so-called unregulated wholesale markets have a tremendous amount of regulation around them. So there is, it's not a black or white regulated or deregulated industry. And the third, the third point I'd make is that in the 70s and 80s, utilities went into unregulated businesses that were along the value chain of large-scale power manufacturing. They went into things like rail cars that carried coal and, and insurance and stuff that wasn't often core to their value chain and was nowhere near their customer and the transformation of the industry. If they go in now, they're, they're, they should be in businesses that are very closely coupled to what they are doing. And that's a different character than an electric utility owning a life insurance company or a rail car savings company or a savings and loan. So this will be a different uh, sort of foray, I think, and quite appropriately so. Uh, I, I think what one looks like, uh, what one electric utility, investor on utility looks like in uh, 20 years or something is a, a difficult question, but I'm going to make a couple stabs at it. First, I think we will, we will basically have uh, unregulated wholesale generation most anywhere, everywhere. Uh, possible exception <laughs> will be the southern company. Uh, you know, they, they seem to be a citadel. But um, I, I think that will uh, continue to spread. I think it's going to happen in the West. Uh, they're putting their toe in their water in several ways. 
So what does a utility look like? A utility looks like a wires company. That's my estimate. Uh, I think that's Peter's smart integrator. Are they up to the task? I think so, actually. They're, they're really good at running systems like this. This one's a little more electronic. What we're talking about now is a little more information-based and electronic than what they've been doing before. But utilities are really good at managing kind of large things, large construction projects, large power plants. Um, and I, I don't see any per se reason. They're going to be... Uh, they're going to have right of first refusal for lots of things. Um, that's not to say that Google or, you know, name your company, name your favorite um, uh, company might not try to get in on it. But, but I think, um, I think utilities, uh, you know, they got a lot of, they got a lot of capital in there right now. They own a lot of stuff. So I think it's going to be quite a while before they're edged out of that. So I think running, so back to Peter's models, I think the more likely of the two scenarios is the smart integrator, where somebody has got to make sure that refrigerator is talking to the ISO and you know and and the the prices are and, and there's so many other applications. I mean, they, they all sound kind of cheesy in, in some sense, you know, using your iPad to set your temperature in your car while, while you're driving home. I mean, you know. I, I've stopped trying to make up examples of what the future is going to look like because they all kind of sound cheesy. But if you go back to what I said earlier about sort of the Internet, just think about what that represents in your life. Um, and you couldn't have predicted that 10 years ago or 15 years ago, certainly not. Um, we're going we're gonna to face something very similar. Well, as long as it's squirrel proof, that's all I really am worried about. <laughs> um, the uh, I want you to. Uh, it's it's unfortunate. This is a panel that I I personally could go at least a few more hours if we ordered some takeout, um, and uh, I know most of you could too. So, uh, will you please help me thank the panel for their time? Thank you.